Chapter 101 of The Count of Monte Cristo. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 101. Locusta. Valentine was alone. Two other clocks, slower than that of Saint Philippe du Roule, struck the hour of midnight from different directions, and excepting the rumbling of a few carriages, all was silent. Then Valentine's attention was engrossed by the clock in her room, which marked the seconds. She began counting them, remarking that they were much slower than the beatings of her heart, and still she doubted. The inoffensive Valentine could not imagine that anyone should desire her death. Why should they? To what end? What had she done to excite the malice of an enemy? There was no fear of her falling asleep. One terrible idea pressed upon her mind, that someone existed in the world who had attempted to assassinate her, and who was about to endeavor to do so again. Supposing this person, worried at the inefficacy of the poison, should, as Monte Cristo intimated, have recourse to steal. What if the Count should have no time to run to her rescue? What if her last moments were approaching, and she should never again see Moro? When this terrible chain of ideas presented itself, Valentine was nearly persuaded to ring the bell and call for help. But through the door, she fancied she saw the luminous eye of the Count, that eye which lived in her memory, and the recollection overwhelmed her with so much shame that she asked herself whether any amount of gratitude could ever repay his adventurous and devoted friendship. Twenty minutes, twenty tedious minutes passed thus, then ten more, and at last, the clock struck the half hour. Just then, the sound of fingernails slightly grating against the door of the library informed Valentine that the Count was still watching and recommended her to do the same. At the same time, on the opposite side that is towards Edward's room, Valentine fancied that she heard the creaking of the floor. She listened attentively, holding her breath till she was nearly suffocated. The lock turned, and the door slowly opened. Valentine had raised herself upon her elbow and had scarcely time to throw herself down on the bed and shade her eyes with her arm. Then, trembling, agitated, and her heart beating with indescribable terror, she awaited the event. Someone approached the bed and drew back the curtains. Valentine summoned every effort and breathed with a regular respiration which announces tranquil sleep. Valentine, said a low voice, still silent. Valentine had promised not to awake. Then everything was still, excepting that Valentine heard the almost noiseless sound of some liquid being poured into the glass she had just emptied. Then she ventured to open her eyelids and glance over her extended arm. She saw a woman in a white dressing gown pouring liquid from a vial into her glass. During this short time, Valentine must have held her breath, or moved in some slight degree, for the woman, disturbed, stopped and leaned over the bed in order the better to ascertain whether Valentine slept. It was Madame de Villefort. On recognizing her stepmother, Valentine could not repress a shudder, which caused a vibration in the bed. Madame de Villefort instantly stepped back close to the wall, and there, shaded by the bed curtains, she silently and attentively watched the slightest movement of Valentine. The latter recollected the terrible caution of Monte Cristo. She fancied, that the hand not holding the file clasped a long, sharp knife. Then, collecting all her remaining strength, she forced herself to close her eyes. But this simple operation upon the most delicate organs of our frame, generally so easy to accomplish, became almost impossible at this moment. So much did curiosity struggle to retain the eyelid open and learn the truth. Madame de Villefort, however, Reassured by the silence, which was alone disturbed by the regular breathing of Valentine, again extended her hand, and half hidden by the curtains succeeded in emptying the contents of the phial into the glass. Then she retired so gently that Valentine did not know she had left the room. She only witnessed the withdrawal of the arm, the fair round arm of a woman but twenty-five years old, and who yet spread death around her. It is impossible to describe the sensations experienced by Valentine 
During the minute and a half, Madame de Villefort remained in the room. The grating against the library door aroused the young girl from the stupor in which she was plunged, and which almost amounted to insensibility. She raised her head with an effort. The noiseless door again turned on its hinges, and the Count of Monte Cristo reappeared. "Well," said he, "do you still doubt?" "Oh," murmured the young girl. Have you seen? Alas! Did you recognize? Valentine groaned. Oh yes, she said. I saw, but I cannot believe. Would you rather die then and cause Maximilian's death? Oh, repeated the young girl, almost bewildered. Can I not leave the house? Can I not escape? Valentine, the hand which now threatens you will pursue you everywhere. Your servants will be seduced with gold, and death will be offered to you disguised in every shape. You will find it in the water you drink from the spring, in the fruit you pluck from the tree. But did you not say that my kind grandfather's precaution had neutralized the poison? Yes, but not against a strong dose. The poison will be changed and the quantity increased. He took the glass and raised it to his lips. It is already done, he said. Brucine is no longer employed, but a simple narcotic. I can recognize the flavor of the alcohol in which it has been dissolved. If you had taken what Madame de Villefort had poured into your glass, Valentine, Valentine, you would have been doomed. But, exclaimed the young girl, why am I thus pursued? Why, are you so kind, so good, so unsuspicious of ill that you cannot understand, Valentine? No, I have never injured her. But you are rich, Valentine. You have two hundred thousand livres a year, and you prevent her son from enjoying these two hundred thousand livres. How so? The fortune is not her gift, but is inherited from my relations. Certainly, and that is why Monsieur and Madame de Saint Méran have died. That is why Monsieur Noirtier was sentenced the day he made you his heir. That is why you, in your turn, are to die. It is because your father will inherit your property, and your brother, his only son, succeed to his. Edward, poor child, are all these crimes committed on his account? Ah, then you at length understand. Heaven grant that this may not be visited upon him. Valentine, you are an angel. But why is my grandfather allowed to live? It was considered that you dead. The fortune would naturally revert to your brother, unless he were disinherited, and besides, the crime appearing useless, it would be folly to commit it. And is it possible that this frightful combination of crimes has been invented by a woman? Do you recollect in the arbor of the Hotel de Poste, at Perugia, seeing a man in the brown cloak, whom your stepmother was questioning up on Aquatofana? Well, ever since then. The infernal project has been ripening in her brain. Ah, then, indeed, sir," said the sweet girl, bathing tears. "I see that I am condemned to die. No, Valentine, for I have foreseen all their plots. No, your enemy is conquered, since we know her, and you will live, Valentine, live to be happy yourself, and to confer happiness upon a noble heart. But to ensure this, you must rely on me." Command me, sir. What am I to do? You must blindly take what I give you. Alas, were it only for my own sake, I should prefer to die. You must not confide in anyone, not even in your father. My father is not engaged in this fearful plot, is he, sir? Asked Valentine, clasping her hands. No, and yet your father, a man accustomed to judicial accusations. Ought to have known that all these deaths have not happened naturally. It is he who should have watched over you. He should have occupied my place. He should have emptied that glass. He should have risen against the assassin, spectre against spectre. He murmured in a low voice, as he concluded his sentence. Sir, said Valentine, I will do all I can to live, for there are two beings whose existence depend upon mine. My grandfather and Maximilian. 
I will watch over them as I have over you. Well, sir, do as you will with me. And then she added in a low voice, "Oh heavens, what will befall me?" Whatever may happen, Valentine, do not be alarmed. Though you suffer, though you lose sight, hearing, consciousness, fear nothing. Though you should awake and be ignored where you are, still do not fear. Even though you should find yourself in the sepulchral vault or coffin, reassure yourself. Then, and say to yourself, at this moment, a friend, a father, who lives for my happiness and that of Maximilian, watches over me. Alas, alas, what a fearful extremity! Valentin, would you rather denounce your stepmother? I would rather die a hundred times. Oh yes, die. No, you will not die. But will you promise me, whatever happens, that you will not complain but hope? I will think of Maximilian. You are my own darling child, Valentine. I alone can save you, and I will. Valentine, in the extremity of her terror, joined her hands, for she felt that the moment had arrived to ask for courage, and began to pray. And while uttering little more. In incoherent words, she forgot that her white shoulders had no other covering than her long hair, and that the pulsations of her heart could be seen through the lace of her nightdress. Monte Cristo gently laid his hand on the young girl's arm, drew the velvet coverlet close to her throat, and said with a paternal smile, "My child, believe in my devotion to you, as you believe in the goodness of Providence and the love of Maximilian." Then he drew from his waistcoat pocket the little emerald box, raised the golden lid, and took from it a pastille about the size of a pea, which he placed in her hand. She took it, and looked attentively on the count. There was an expression on the face of her intrepid protector, which commanded her veneration. She evidently interrogated him by her look. Yes, said he. Valentine carried the pastille to her mouth and swallowed it. And now, my dear child, adieu for the present. I will try and gain a little sleep, for you are saved. Go," said Valentine. "Whatever happens, I promise you not to fear." Monte Cristo, for some time, kept his eyes fixed on the young girl, who gradually fell asleep, yielding to the effects of the narcotic the Count had given her. Then he took the glass. Emptied three parts of the contents in the fireplace, that it might be supposed Valentine had taken it, and replaced it on the table. Then he disappeared, after throwing a farewell glance on Valentine, who slept with the confidence and innocence of an angel. End of chapter one o one. Chapter one hundred and two of the Count of Monte Cristo. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. The nightlight continued to burn on the chimney piece, exhausting the last few drops of oil which floated on the surface of the water. The globe of the lamp appeared of a reddish hue, and the flame, brightening before it expired, threw out the last flickerings, which, in an inanimate object, have been so often compared to the convulsions of a human creature in his final agonies. A dull, dismal light was shed over the bedclothes and curtains surrounding the young girl. All noise of the streets had ceased, and the silence was frightful. It was then that the door of Edward's room opened, and a head, which we have before noticed, appeared in the glass opposite. It was Madame de Villefort who came to witness the effects of the drink she had prepared. She stopped in the doorway, listened for a moment to the flickering of the lamp, the only sound in the deserted room, and then advanced to the table to see if Valentine's glass was empty. It was still about a quarter full. Which we have before stated, Madame de Villefort emptied the contents into the ashes, which she disturbed that they might more readily absorb the liquid. Then she carefully rinsed the glass and, wiping it with her handkerchief, replaced it on the table. If any one could have looked into the room just then, he would have noticed the hesitation with which Madame de Villefort approached the bed and looked fixedly on Valentine. The dim light, 
the profound silence, and the gloomy thoughts inspired by the hour, and still more of her own conscience, all combined to produce the sensation of fear. The poisoner was terrified at the contemplation of her own work. At length she rallied, drew aside the curtain, and leaning over the pillow gazed intently on Valentine. The young girl no longer breathed, no breath issued through the half-closed teeth, the white lips no longer quivered, the eyes were suffused with a bluish vapour, and the long black lashes rested on her cheek white as wax. Madame de Villefort gazed upon her face so expressive even in its stillness. Then she ventured to raise the coverlet and press her hands upon the young girl's heart. It was cold and motionless. She felt only the pulsation of her own fingers and withdrew her hand with a shudder. One arm was hanging out of the bed. From the shoulder to elbow it was moulded after the arms of Germaine Pillon's graces. But the forearm seemed to be slightly distorted by convulsion, and the hand, so delicately formed, was resting with stiff outstretched fingers on the framework of the bed. The nails, too, were turning blue. Madame de Villefort had no longer any doubts. All was over. She had consummated the last terrible work she had to accomplish. There was no more to do in the room, so the poisoner retired stealthily, as though fearing to hear the sound of her own footsteps. But as she withdrew, she held aside the curtain, absorbed in the irresistible attraction, always averted by the picture of death, so long as it was merely mysterious, and does not excite disgust. Just then the lamp again flickered. The noise startled Madame de Villefort, who shuddered and dropped the curtain. Immediately afterwards, the light expired, and the room was plunged into frightful obscurity, while the clock at that minute struck half-past four. Overpowered by agitation, the poisoner succeeded in groping her way to the door and reached her room in an agony of fear. The darkness lasted two hours longer. Then, by degrees of a cold light, crept through the Venetian blinds until at length it was revealed the object in the room. About this time the nurse's cough was heard on the stairs and the woman entered the room with a cup in her hand. To the tender eye of a father or a lover, the first glance would have sufficed to reveal Valentine's condition, but to this hireling, Valentine only appeared to sleep. Good, she exclaimed, approaching the table. She has taken part of her draught. The glass is three quarters empty. Then she went to the fireplace and lit the fire, and, although she had just left her bed, she could not resist the temptation offered by Valentine's sleep, so she threw herself onto an armchair and snatched a little more rest. The clock striking eight awoke her. Astonished at the prolonged slumber of the patient, and frightened to see that the arm was still hanging out of bed, she advanced towards Valentine, and for the first time noticed the white lips. She tried to replace the arm, but it moved with a frightful rigidity which could not deceive a sick nurse. She screamed aloud, then, running to the door, exclaimed, Help! Help! "'What is the matter?' asked Monsieur Daverny, at the foot of the stairs, it being the hour he usually visited her. "'What is it?' asked Villefort, rushing from his home. "'Doctor, do you hear them call for help?' "'Yes, let us hasten up. It was in Valentine's room.' But before the doctor and the father could reach the room, the servants, who were on the same floor, had entered, and seeing Valentine pale and motionless on the bed, had lifted their hands towards heaven, and stood transfixed, as though struck by lightning. "'Call Madame de Villefort! Wake Madame de Villefort!' cried the procureur from the door of his chamber, which apparently he scarcely dared to leave. But instead of obeying him, the servant stood wa watching Monsieur Danvrenet, who ran to Valentine and raised her in his arms. "'Is this one too?' he exclaimed. "'Oh, where will be the ends?' Villefort rushed into the room. "'What are you saying, doctor?' he exclaimed, raising his hands to heaven. "'I say that Valentine is dead!' exclaimed Dalvrenny, in a voice terrible in its solemn calm. Monsieur de Villefort staggered and buried his head on the bed. On the exclamation of the doctor and the cry of the father, the servants all fled with muttering imprecations. They were heard running down the stairs and through the long passages, 
Then there was a rush in the court. Afterwards all was still. They had, one and all, deserted the accursed house. Just then, Madame de Villefort, in an act of slipping on her dressing gown, threw aside the drapery and for a moment stood motionless, as though interrogating the occupants of the room, while she endeavoured to call upon some rebellious tears. On a sudden she stepped, or rather bounded, with outstretched arms towards the table. She saw Dovrony curiously examine the glass, which she felt certain of having emptied during the night. It was now a third full, just as it was when she threw its contents into the ashes. The spectre of Valentine, rising before the poisoner, would have alarmed her less. It was, indeed, the same colour as the drought she had poured into the glass, and which Valentine had drunk. It was, indeed, the poison, which could not deceive Monsieur Darvrony, which he now examined so closely. It was doubtless a miracle from heaven that, notwithstanding her precautions, there should be some trace, some proof remaining to reveal the crime. While Madame de Villefort remained rooted to the spot like a statue of terror, and Villefort, with his head hidden in the bedclothes, saw nothing around him, Darvrony approached the window, that he might the better examine the contents of the glass, and dipped his finger in and tasted it. Ah! he exclaimed. It is no longer brucine that is used. Let me see what it is. Then he ran to one of the cupboards in Valentine's room, which had been transformed into a medicine closet, and taking from its silver case a small bottle of nitric acid, dropped it at the liqueur, which immediately changed to a blood-red colour. Ah! exclaimed Daphne, in a voice which the horror of a judge revealed the truth was mingling with delight of a student making a discovery. Madame de Villefort was overpowered. Her eyes first flashed, then swam. She staggered towards the door and disappeared. Directly afterwards, the distant sound of a heavy weight falling on the ground was heard, but no one paid much attention to it. The nurse was engaged in watching the chemical analysis, and Villefort was absorbed in grief. Monsieur Darvrenny, alone had followed Madame de Villefort with his eyes, and watched her hurried retreat. He lifted up the drapery over the entrance to Edward's room, and his eyes reached as far as Madame de Villefort's apartment. He beheld her extended lifeless on the floor. "'Go to the assistance of Madame de Villefort,' he said to the nurses. "'Madame de Villefort is ill.' "'But Mademoiselle de Villefort,' stammered the nurse." Mademoiselle de Villefort no longer requires help, said Darvery, since she is dead. Dead, dead, groaned forth Villefort, in a paroxysm of grief, which was more terrible than the novelty of the sensation in the iron heart of that man. Dead, repeated a third voice. Who said Valentine was dead? The two men turned around and saw Morrel, standing at the door, pale and terror-stricken. This is what had happened. At the usual time, Morrel had presented himself at the little door leading to Noirtier's room. Contrary to custom, the door was open, and having no occasion to ring, he entered. He waited for a moment in the hall, and called for a servant to conduct him to Monsieur Noirtier. But no one answered, the servant having, as we know, deserted the house. Morrel had no particular reason for uneasiness. Monte Cristo had promised him that Valentine should live, and, so far, he had always fulfilled his word. Every night, the Count had given him news, which the next morning confirmed by Noachia. Still, this extraordinary silence appeared strange to him, and he called a second and a third time. Still no answer. Then he determined to go on. Noirtier's room was opened, like all the rest. The first thing he saw was the old man sitting in the armchair in his usual place. But his eyes expressed alarm, which was confirmed by the pallor in which overspread his features. "'How are you, sir?' asked Morrel, with sickness of heart. "'Well,' answered the old man, by closing his eyes. But his appearance manifested increasing uneasiness. You are thoughtful, sir. 
continued Morrel. You want something. Shall I call one of the servants? Yes, replied Noirtier. Morrel pulled the bell. And though he nearly broke the cord, no one answered. He turned towards Noirtier. The pallor and anguish expressed in his countenance momentarily increased. Oh, exclaimed Morrel. Why do they not come? Is anyone ill in the house? The eyes of Noirtier seemed as though they would start from their sockets. What's the matter? You alarm me. Valentine? Valentine? Yes, yes, sighed Noirtier. Maximilian tried to speak, but he could articulate nothing. He staggered and supported himself against the wainscot. Then he pointed at the door. Yes, 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 continued the old man. Maximilian rushed up the staircase, while Noirtier's eyes seemed to say, Quicker, quicker! In a minute the young man darted through several rooms, till at length he reached Valentine's. There was no occasion to push the door, it was wide open. A sob was the only thing he heard. He saw, as though in a mist, a black figure kneeling and buried in a confused mass of white drapery. A terrible fear transfixed him. It was then he heard a voice exclaim, Valentine is dead, and another voice, which, like an echo, repeated, Dead, dead. End of chapter 102 Chapter 103 of The Count of Monte Cristo The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas Chapter 103 Maximilian Villefort rose, half ashamed of being surprised in such a paroxysm of grief. The terrible office he had held for twenty-five years had succeeded in making him more or less than man. His glance, at first wandering, fixed itself upon Morel. "'Who are you, sir?' he asked, "'that you forget that this is not the manner to enter a house stricken with death. Go, sir, go!' But Morel remained motionless. He could not detach his eyes from that disordered bed and the pale corpse of the young girl who was lying on it. "'Go! Do you hear?' said Villefort, while Dervini advanced to lead Morel out. Maximilian stared for a moment at the corpse, gazed all around the room, then upon the two men. He opened his mouth to speak, but finding it impossible to give utterance to the innumerable ideas that occupied his brain, he went out thrusting his hands through his hair in such a manner that Villefort and Darvini, for a moment, diverted from the engrossing topic, exchanged glances, which seemed to say, He is mad! But in less than five minutes the staircase groaned beneath an extraordinary weight. Morel was seen carrying, with superhuman strength, the armchair containing Nortier upstairs. When he reached the landing, he placed the armchair on the floor and rapidly rolled it into Valentine's room. This could only have been accomplished by means of unnatural strength supplied by powerful excitement. But the most fearful spectacle was Nortier being pushed towards the bed, his face expressing all the meaning and his eyes supplying the want of every other faculty. That pale face and flaming glance appeared to Villefort like a frightful apparition. Each time he had been brought into contact with his father, something terrible had happened. "'See what they have done!' cried Morel, with one hand leaning on the back of the chair and the other extended toward Valentine. "'See, my father, see!' Villefort drew back and looked with astonishment on the young man, who, almost a stranger to him, called Nortier his father. At this moment, the whole soul of the old man seemed centered in his eyes, which became bloodshot. The veins of the throat swelled, his cheeks and temples became purple, as though he was struck with epilepsy. Nothing was wanting to complete this but the utterance of a cry, and the cry issued from his pores, if we may thus speak, a cry frightful in its silence. Darvigny rushed towards the old man and made him inhale a powerful restorative. Sir, cried Morel, seizing the moist hand of the paralytic, they ask me who I am and what right I have to be here. Oh, you know it. 
Tell them, tell them. And the young man's voice was choked by sobs. As for the old man, his chest heaved with his panting respiration. One could have thought that he was undergoing the agonies preceding death. At length, happier than the young man, who sobbed without weeping, tears glistened in the eyes of Nortier. Tell them, said Morel in a hoarse voice, tell them that I am her betrothed. Tell them she was my beloved, my noble girl, my only blessing in the world. Tell them, oh, tell them that corpse belongs to me. The young man, overwhelmed by the weight of his anguish, fell heavily on his knees before the bed, which his fingers grasped with convulsive energy. Darvigny, unable to bear the sight of this touching emotion, turned away, and Villefort, without seeking any further explanation, and attracted towards him by the irresistible magnetism which draws us towards those who have loved the people for whom we mourn, extended his hand towards the young man. But Morel saw nothing. He had grasped the hand of Valentine, and unable to weep, vented his agony in groans as he bit the sheets. For some time nothing was heard in that chamber but sobs, exclamations, and prayers. At length Villefort, the most composed of all, spoke. Sir, said he to Maximilian, you say you loved Valentine, that you were betrothed to her. I knew nothing of this engagement, of this love, yet I, her father, forgive you, for I see that your grief is real and deep and besides my own sorrow is too great for anger to find a place in my heart. But you see that the angel whom you hoped for has left this earth. She has nothing more to do with the adoration of men. Take a last farewell, sir, of her sad remains. Take the hand you expected to possess once more within your own, and then separate yourself from her forever. Valentine now requires only the ministrations of the priest. "'You are mistaken, sir,' exclaimed Morel, raising himself on one knee, his heart pierced by a more acute pang than any he had ever felt. "'You are mistaken. Valentine, dying as she has, not only requires a priest, but an avenger. You, Monsieur de Villefort, send for the priest. I will be the avenger.' "'What do you mean, sir?' asked Villefort, trembling at the new idea inspired by the delirium of Morel. "'I tell you, sir, that two persons exist in you. The father has mourned sufficiently. Now let the procurer fill his office.' The eyes of Nortier glistened, and Darvigny approached. "'Gentlemen,' said Morel, reading all that passed through the minds of the witnesses to the scene, "'I know what I am saying.' And you know as well as I do what I am about to say. Valentine has been assassinated. Villefort hung his head. Darvigny approached nearer, and Nortier said, Yes, with his eyes. Now, sir, continued Morel, in these days no one can disappear by violent means without some inquiries being made as to the cause of her disappearance, even were she not a young, beautiful, and adorable creature like Valentine. Mr. Procureur, said Morel with increasing vehemence, no mercy is allowed. I denounce the crime. It is your place to seek the assassin. The young man's implacable eyes interrogated Villefort, who, on his side, glanced from Nortier to Darvigny. But, instead of finding sympathy in the eyes of the doctor and his father, he only saw an expression as inflexible as that of Maximilian. Yes, indicated the old man. Assuredly, said Darvigny. Sir, said Villefort, striving to struggle against this triple force and his own emotion, Sir, you are deceived. No one commits crimes here. I am stricken by fate. It is horrible indeed, but no one assassinates. The eyes of Nortier lighted up with rage, and Darvigny prepared to speak. Morel, however, extended his arm and commanded silence. And I say that murders are committed here, said Morel, whose voice, though lower in tone, lost none of its terrible distinctness. 
I tell you that this is the fourth victim within the last four months. I tell you, Valentine's life was attempted by poison four days ago, though she escaped owing to the precautions of Monsieur Nortier. I tell you that the dose has been double, the poison changed, and that this time it has succeeded. I tell you that you know these things as well as I do, since this gentleman has forewarned you, both as a doctor and as a friend. Oh, you rave, sir, exclaimed Villefort, in vain endeavoring to escape the net in which he was taken. I rave, said Morel. Well, then I appeal to Monsieur Darvigny himself. Ask him, sir, if he recollects the words he uttered in the garden of this house on the night of Madame de saint Moran's death. You thought yourselves alone, and talked about that tragical death, and the fatality you mentioned then is the same which has caused the murder of Valentine. Villefort and Darvigny exchanged looks. Yes, yes, continued Morel. Recall the scene, for the words you thought were only given to silence and solitude fell into my ears. Certainly, after witnessing the culpable indolence manifested by Monsieur de Villefort towards his own relations, I ought to have denounced him to the authorities. Then I should not have been an accomplice to thy death, as I now am, sweet, beloved Valentine. But the accomplice shall become the avenger. This fourth murder is apparent to all, and if thy father abandon thee, Valentine, it is I, and I swear it, that shall pursue the assassin. And this time, as though nature had at least taken compassion on the vigorous frame, nearly bursting with its own strength, the words of Morel were stifled in his throat. His breast heaved. The tears, so long rebellious, gushed from his eyes, and he threw himself weeping on his knees by the side of the bed. Then Darvigny spoke, and I too, he exclaimed in a low voice, I unite with Monsieur Morel in demanding justice for crime. My blood boils at the idea of having encouraged a murderer by my cowardly concession. Oh, merciful heavens, murmured Villefort. Morel raised his head, and reading the eyes of the old man, which gleamed with unnatural luster, Stay, he said. Monsieur Nortier wishes to speak. Yes, indicated Nortier, with an expression the more terrible, from all his faculties being centered in a glance. Do you know the assassin? asked Morel. Yes, replied Nortier. And will you direct us? exclaimed the young man. Listen, Monsieur Darvigny, listen. Nortier looked upon Morel with one of those melancholy smiles which had so often made Valentine happy, and thus fixed his attention. Then, having riveted the eyes of his intercalator on his own, he glanced toward the door. "'Do you wish me to leave?' said Morel, sadly. "'Yes,' replied Nortier. "'Alas, alas, sir, have pity on me!' The old man's eyes remained fixed on the door. "'May I at least return?' asked Morel. "'Yes.' "'Must I leave alone?' "'No.' "'Whom am I to take with me? The procureur?' "'No. The doctor?' "'Yes.' "'You wish to remain alone with Monsieur de Villefort?' "'Yes.' "'But can he understand you?' "'Yes.' "'Oh,' said Villefort, inexpressibly delighted to think that the inquiries were to be made by him alone. Oh, be satisfied. I can understand my father. Darvigny took the young man's arm and led him out of the room. A more than death-like silence then reigned in the house. At the end of a quarter of an hour a faltering footstep was heard, and Villefort appeared at the door of the apartment where Darvigny and Morel had been staying. One absorbed in meditation, the other in grief. You can come, he said, and led them back to Nordier. Morel looked attentively on Villefort. His face was livid, large drops rolled down his face, and in his fingers he held the fragments of a quill pen which he had torn to atoms. Gentlemen, he said in a hoarse voice, give me your word of honor that this horrible secret shall forever remain buried amongst ourselves. The two men drew back. I entreat you, continued Villefort. But, said Morel, the culprit, the murderer, the assassin. 
Do not alarm yourself, sir. Justice will be done, said Villefort. My father has revealed the culprit's name. My father thirsts for revenge as much as you do, yet even he conjures you as I do to keep this secret. Do you not, father? Yes, resolutely replied Nordier. Morel suffered an exclamation of horror and surprise to escape him. Oh, sir, said Villefort, arresting Maximilian by the arm, if my father, the inflexible man, makes this request, it is because he knows, be assured, that Valentine will be terribly revenged. Is it not so, father? The old man made a sign in the affirmative. Villefort continued, He knows me, and I have pledged my word to him. Rest assured, gentlemen, that within three days, in a less time than justice would demand, the revenge I shall have taken for the murder of my child will be such as to make the boldest heart tremble. And as he spoke these words, he ground his teeth and grasped the old man's senseless hand. Will this promise be fulfilled, Monsieur Nortier? asked Morel, while Darvigny looked inquiringly. Yes, replied Nortier with an expression of sinister joy. Swear, then, said Villefort, joining the hands of Morel and Darvigny, swear that you will spare the honor of my house, and leave me to avenge my child. Darvigny turned round and uttered a very feeble yes, but Morel, disengaging his hand, rushed to the bed, and after having pressed the cold lips of Valentine with his own, hurriedly left, uttering a long, deep groan of despair and anguish. We have before stated that all the servants had fled. Monsieur de Villefort was therefore obliged to request Monsieur de Varny to superintend all the arrangements consequent upon the death in a large city, more especially a death under such suspicious circumstances. It was something terrible to witness the silent agony, the mute despair of Nortier, whose tears silently rolled down his cheeks. Villefort retired to his study, and Davarny left to summon the doctor of the mayorality, whose office it is to examine bodies after decease, and who is expressly named the doctor of the dead. Monsieur Nortier could not be persuaded to quit his grandchild. At the end of a quarter of an hour, Monsieur de Varny returned with his associate. They found the outer gate closed, and not a servant remaining in the house. Villefort himself was obliged to open to them, but he stopped on the landing, he had not the courage to again visit the death chamber. The two doctors, therefore, entered the room alone. Nortier was near the bed, pale, motionless, and silent as the corpse. The district doctor approached with the indifference of a man accustomed to spend half his time amongst the dead. He then lifted up the sheet which was placed over the face, and just unclosed the lips. Alas, said Dauvergne, she is indeed dead, poor child. Yes, answered the doctor laconically, dropping the sheet he had raised. Nortier uttered a kind of hoarse, rattling sound. The old man's eyes sparkled, and the good doctor understood that he wished to behold his child. He therefore approached the bed, and while his companion was dipping his fingers with which he had touched the lips of the corpse in chloride of lime, he uncovered the calm and pale face, which looked like that of a sleeping angel. A tear, which appeared in the old man's eye, expressed his thanks to the doctor. The doctor of the dead then laid his permit on the corner of the table, and, having fulfilled his duty, was conducted out by de Varny. Villefort met them at the door of his study. Having in a few words thanked the district doctor, he turned to de Varny and said, And now for the priest. Is there any particular priest you wish to pray with Valentine? asked de Varny. No said Villefort. Fetch the nearest. The nearest, said the district doctor, is a good Italian abbey, who lives next door to you. Shall I call on him as I pass? Davarny, said Villefort, be so kind, I beseech you, as to accompany this gentleman. Here is the key of the door, so that you can go in and out as you please. You will bring the priest with you, and will oblige me by introducing him into my child's room. Do you wish to see him? I only wish to be alone. You will excuse me, will you not? A priest can understand a father's grief. And Monsieur de Villefort, giving the key to Davarny, 
again bade farewell to the strange doctor, and retired to his study where he began to work. For some temperaments, work is a remedy for all afflictions. As the doctors entered the street, they saw a man in a cassock standing on the threshold of the next door. This is the abbey of whom I spoke, said the doctor to de Varnier. De Varnier accosted the priest. Sir, he said, are you disposed to confer a great obligation on an unhappy father who has just lost his daughter? I mean Monsieur de Villefort, the king's attorney. Ah, said the priest, in a marked Italian accent. Yes, I have heard that death is in that house. Then I need not tell you what kind of service he requires of you. I was about to offer myself, sir, said the priest. It is our mission to forestall our duties. It is a young girl. I know it, sir. The servants who fled the house have informed me. I also know that her name is Valentine, and I have already prayed for her. Thank you, sir, said de Varnier. Since you have commenced your sacred office, design to continue it. Come and watch by the dead, and all the wretched family will be grateful to you. I am going, sir, and I do not hesitate to say that no prayers will be more fervent than mine. Davarny took the priest's hand, and without meeting Villefort, who was engaged in his study, they reached Valentine's room, which on the following night was to be occupied by the undertakers. On entering the room, Nortier's eyes met those of the abbey, and no doubt he read some particular expression in them, for he remained in the room. Davarny recommended the attention of the priest to the living as well as to the dead, and the abbey promised to devote his prayers to Valentine and his attentions to Nortier in order, doubtless, that he might not be disturbed while fulfilling his sacred mission, the priest rose as soon as Darvarny departed, and not only bolted the door through which the doctor had just left, but also that leading to Madame de Villefort's room. End of chapter 103 Chapter 104 of The Count of Monte Cristo The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 104 Danglar's Signature the next morning dawned dull and cloudy. During the night the undertakers had executed their melancholy office and wrapped the corpse in the winding sheet, which, whatever may be said about the equality of death, is at least a last proof of the luxury so pleasing in life. This winding sheet was nothing more than a beautiful piece of cambric which the young girl had bought a fortnight before. During the evening two men, engaged for the purpose, had carried Nortier from Valentine's room into his own, and contrary to all expectation, there was no difficulty in withdrawing him from his child. The Abbé Busoni had watched till daylight, and then left without calling anyone. D'Avrigny returned about eight o'clock in the morning, he met Villefort on his way to Nortier's room, and accompanied him to see how the old man had slept. They found him in the large armchair, which served him for a bed, enjoying a calm, nay, almost a smiling sleep. They both stood in amazement at the door. See, said D'Avrigny to Villefort, nature knows how to alleviate the deepest sorrow. No one can say that Monsieur Nortier did not love his child, and yet he sleeps. Yes, you are right, replied Villefort, surprised. He sleeps indeed, and this is the more strange, since the least contradiction keeps him awake all night. Grief has stunned him, replied D'Avrigny, and they both returned thoughtfully to the procurer's study. See, I have not slept, said Villefort, showing his undisturbed bed. Grief does not stun me. I have not been in bed for two nights. But then look at my desk. See what I have written during these last two days and nights. I have filled those papers, and have made out the accusation against the assassin Benedetto. Oh, work, work, my passion, my joy, my delight, it is for thee to alleviate my sorrows. And he convulsively grasped the hand of Duvarny. "'Do you require my services now?' asked D'Avrigny. "'No,' said Villefort. "'Only return at eleven o'clock. "'At twelve the... the... oh, heavens, my poor, poor child!' "'And the procureur, again becoming a man, lifted up his eyes and groaned. "'Shall you be present in the reception room?' "'No. I have a cousin who has undertaken this sad office. "'I shall work, doctor.' When I work, I forget everything. And, indeed, no sooner had the doctor left the room 
Then he was again absorbed in study. On the doorsteps, Darvagny met the cousin whom Villefort had mentioned, a personage as insignificant in our story as in the world he occupied, one of those beings designed from their birth to make themselves useful to others. He was punctual, dressed in black, with crepe around his hat, and presented himself at his cousin's with a face made up for the occasion, and which he could alter as might be required. At twelve o'clock the morning coaches rolled into the paved court, and the Rue de Faubourg saint Honore was filled with a crowd of idlers, equally pleased to witness the festivities or the mourning of the rich, and who rushed with the same avidity to a funeral procession as to the marriage of a duchess. Gradually the reception room filled, and some of our old friends made their appearance. We mean Debray, Chateau Renaud, and Beauchamp, accompanied by all the leading men of that day at the bar, in literature, or the army, for M. de Villefort moved in the first Parisian circles, less owing to his social position than to his personal merit. The cousins standing at the door ushered in the guests, and it was rather a relief to the indifferent to see a person as unmoved as themselves, and who did not exact a mournful face or forced tears, as would have been the case with a father, a brother, or a lover. Those who were acquainted soon formed into little groups. One of them was made of Debray, Chateau Renaud, and Beauchamp. Poor girl, said Debray, like the rest, paying an involuntary tribute to the sad event. Poor girl, so young, so rich, so beautiful. Could you have imagined this scene, Chateau Renaud? when we saw her at the most three weeks ago, about to sign that contract? Indeed, no, said Chateau Renaud. Did you know her? I spoke to her once or twice at Madame de Morcerf's, among the rest. She appeared to me charming, though rather melancholy. Where is her stepmother, do you know? She is spending the day with the wife of the worthy gentleman who is receiving us. Who is he? Whom do you mean? The gentleman who receives us. Is he a deputy? Oh, no. I am condemned to witness those gentlemen every day, said Beauchamp, but he is perfectly unknown to me. Have you mentioned this death in your paper? It has been mentioned, but the article is not mine. Indeed, I doubt if it will please Monsieur Villefort, for it says that if four successive deaths had happened anywhere else than in the house of the king's attorney, he would have interested himself somewhat more about it. Still, said Chanel Renaud, D'Arvagny, who attends my mother, declares he is in despair about it. But whom are you seeking, Debray? I am seeking the Count of Monte Cristo, said the young man. I met him on the boulevard on my way here, said Beauchamp. I think he is about to leave Paris. He was going to his banker. His banker? Danglars is his banker, is he not? asked Chanel Renaud of Debray. I believe so, replied the secretary with slight uneasiness. But Monte Cristo is not the only one I miss here. I do not see Morel. Morel? Do they know him? asked Chanel Renaud. I think he has only been introduced to Madame de Villefort. Still, he ought to have been here, said Debray. I wonder what will be talked about tonight. This funeral is the news of the day. But hush, here comes our Minister of Justice. He will feel obliged to make some little speech to the cousin. And the three young men drew near to listen. Beauchamp told the truth when he said that on his way to the funeral he had met Monte Cristo, who was directing his steps towards the Rue de la Chuse d'Antin, to Monsieur Danglars. The banker saw the carriage of the Count enter the courtyard, and advanced to meet him with a sad though affable smile. Well, said he, extending his hand to Monte Cristo, I suppose you have come to sympathize with me, for indeed misfortune has taken possession of my house. When I perceived you, I was just asking myself whether I had not wished harm towards those poor Morcerfs, which would have justified the proverb of, He who wishes misfortunes to happen to others experiences them himself. Well, on my word of honor, I answered no. I wished no ill to Morcerf. He was a little proud, perhaps, for a man who, like myself, has risen from nothing. But we all have our faults. Do you know, Count, that persons of our time of life not that you belong to the class, you are still a young man. But as I was saying, persons of our time of life have been very unfortunate this year. For example, look at the puritanical procureur, who has just lost his daughter, and in fact nearly all his family in so singular a manner. More serf dishonored and dead, and then myself covered with ridicule through the villainy of Benedetto. 
Besides, besides what? asked the Count. Alas, you do not know? What new calamity? My daughter, Mademoiselle Danglars. Eugénie has left us. Good heavens, what are you telling me? The truth, my dear Count. Oh, how happy you must be in not having either wife or children. Do you think so? Indeed I do. And so, Mademoiselle Danglars, could not endure the insult offered to us by that wretch, so she asked permission to travel. And she is gone? The other night she left. With Madame Danglars? No, with a relation. But still we have quite lost our dear Eugenie, for I doubt whether her pride will ever allow her to return to France. Still, Baron, said Monte Cristo, family griefs, or indeed any other affliction which would crush a man whose child was his only treasure, are endurable to a millionaire. Philosophers may well say, and practical men will always support the opinion, that money mitigates many trials, and if you admit the efficacy of this sovereign balm, you ought to be very easily consoled, you, the king of finance, the focus of immeasurable power. Danglar looked at him askance, as though to ascertain whether he spoke seriously. Yes, he answered, if a fortune brings consolation, I ought to be consoled, I am rich. So rich, dear sir, that your fortune resembles the pyramids. If you wished to demolish them, you could not, and if it were possible, you would not dare. Danglars smiled at the good-natured pleasantry of the Count. That reminds me, he said, that when you entered I was on the point of signing five little bonds. I have already signed two. Will you allow me to do the same to the others? Pray do so. There was a moment's silence, during which the noise of the banker's pen was alone heard, while Monte Cristo examined the gilt mouldings on the ceiling. Are they Spanish, Haitian, or Neapolitan bonds? said Monte Cristo. No, said Danglars, smiling. They are bonds on the Bank of France, payable to bearer. Stay, Count, he added. You, who may be called the Emperor, if I claim the title of King of Finance, have you many pieces of paper this size, each worth a million? The Count took into his hands the papers, which Danglars had so proudly presented to him, and read, to the governor of the bank, please pay to my order, from the fund deposited by me, the sum of a million, and charge the same to my account. Baron Danglar. One, two, three, four, five, said Monte Cristo. Five millions! Why, what a Croesus you are! This is how I transact business, said Danglar. It is really wonderful, said the Count. Above all, if... As I suppose, it is payable at sight. It is indeed, said Danglars. It is a fine thing to have such credit, really. It is only in France these things are done. Five millions on five little scraps of paper. It must be seen to be believed. You do not doubt it? No. You say so with an accent. Stay. You shall be convinced. Take my clerk to the bank and you will see him leave it with an order on the treasury for the same sum. No, said Monte Cristo, folding the five notes, most decidedly not. The thing is so curious, I will make the experiment myself. I am credited on you for six millions. I have drawn nine hundred thousand francs. You therefore still owe me five millions and a hundred thousand francs. I will take the five scraps of paper that I now hold as bonds, with your signature alone and here is a receipt in full for the six millions between us. I had prepared it beforehand, for I am much in want of money today. And Monte Cristo placed the bonds in his pocket with one hand, while with the other he held out the receipt to Danglar. If a thunderbolt had fallen at the banker's feet, he could not have experienced greater terror. What? he stammered. Do you mean to keep that money? "'Excuse me, excuse me, but I owe this money to the charity fund, "'a deposit which I promised to pay this morning.' "'Oh, well, then,' said Monte Cristo, "'I am not particular about these five notes. "'Pay me in a different form. "'I wished from curiosity to take these "'that I might be able to say that without any advice or preparation "'the house of Denglar had paid me five millions without a minute's delay. "'It would have been remarkable. "'But here are your bonds. Pay me differently.' 
and he held the bonds towards Danglar, who seized them like a vulture extending its claws to withhold the food that is being wrested from its grasp. Suddenly he rallied, made a violent effort to restrain himself, and then a smile gradually widened the features of his disturbed countenance. Certainly, he said, your receipt is money. Oh, dear, yes. And if you were at Rome, the house of Thompson and French would make no more difficulty about paying the money on my receipt than you have just done. Pardon me, Count, pardon me. Then I may keep this money? Yes, said Danglar, while the perspiration started from the roots of his hair. Yes, keep it, keep it. Monte Cristo replaced the notes in his pocket with that indescribable expression which seemed to say, Come, reflect. If you repent, there is still time. No, said Danglars. No, decidedly no. Keep my signatures. But you know, none are so formal as bankers in transacting business. I intended this money for the charity fund, and I seem to be robbing them if I did not pay them with these precise bonds. How absurd as if one crown were not as good as another. Excuse me. And he began to laugh loudly, but nervously. Certainly I excuse you, said Monte Cristo graciously. And pocket them. And he placed the bonds in his pocketbook. But, said Danglars, there is still a sum of one hundred thousand francs. Oh, a mere nothing, said Monte Cristo. The balance would come to about that sum, but keep it, and we shall be quits. Count, said Danglars, are you speaking seriously? I never joke with bankers, said Monte Cristo in a freezing manner, which repelled impertinence, and he turned to the door just as the valet de chambre announced, Monsieur de Beauville, receiver general of the charities. Ma foi, said Monte Cristo, I think I arrived just in time to obtain your signatures, or they would have been disputed with me. Danglars again became pale hastened to conduct the count out. Monte Cristo exchanged a ceremonious bow with Monsieur de Beauville, who was standing in the waiting room, and who was introduced into Danglars' room as soon as the count had left. The count's face was illumined by a faint smile as he noticed the portfolio which the receiver general held in his hand. At the door he found his carriage and was immediately driven to the bank. Meanwhile, Danglars, repressing all emotion, advanced to meet the receiver general. We need not say that a smile of condensation was stamped upon his lips. Good morning, creditor, said he, for I wager anything it is the creditor who visits me. You are right, Baron, answered Monsieur de Beauville. The charities present themselves to you through me. The widows and orphans depute me to receive alms to the amount of five millions from you. And yet they say orphans are to be pitied, said Danglars, wishing to prolong the jest. Poor things. Here I am in their name, said Monsieur de Beauville. But did you receive my letter yesterday? Yes. I have brought my receipt. My dear Monsieur de Beauville, your widows and orphans must oblige me by waiting twenty-four hours, since Monsieur de Monte Cristo, whom you just saw leaving here, you did see him, I think. Yes, well? Well, Monsieur de Monte Cristo has just carried off their five millions. How so? The Count has an unlimited credit upon me, a credit opened by Thompson and French of Rome. He came to demand five millions at once, which I paid him with the checks on the bank. My funds are deposited there, and you can understand that if I draw out ten millions on the same day, it will appear rather strange to the governor. Two days will be a different thing, said Danglars, smiling. Come, said Beauville, with a tone of entire incredulity. Five millions to that gentleman who just left, and who bowed to me as though he knew me? Perhaps he knows you, though you do not know him. Monsieur de Monte Cristo knows everybody. Five millions? Here is his receipt. Believe your own eyes. Monsieur de Beauville took the paper Danglars presented him and read, Received of Baron Danglars the sum of five million one hundred thousand francs to be repaid on demand by the house of Thompson and French of Rome. It is really true, said Monsieur de Beauville. Do you know the house of Thompson in French? Yes. I once had business to transact with it in the amount of 200,000 francs, but since then I have not heard it mentioned. It is one of the best houses in Europe, said Danglars carelessly. 
throwing down the receipt on his desk. And he had five millions in your hands alone? Why, this Count of Monte Cristo must be a nabob. Indeed, I do not know what he is. He has three unlimited credits. One on me, one on Rothschild, one on Lafitte. And you see, he added carelessly, he has given me the preference by leaving me a balance of 100,000 francs. Monsieur de Beauville manifested signs of extraordinary admiration. I must visit him, he said, and obtain some pious grant from him. Oh, you may make sure of him. His charities alone amount to 20,000 francs a month. It is magnificent. I will set before him the example of Madame de Morcerf and her son. What example? They gave all their fortune to the hospitals. What fortune? Their own, Monsieur de Morcerf's, who is deceased. For what reason? Because they would not spend money so guiltily acquired. And what are they to live upon? The mother retires into the country, and the son enters the army. Well, I must confess, these are scruples. I registered their deed of gift yesterday. And how much did they possess? Oh, not much, from twelve to thirteen hundred thousand francs, but to return to our millions. Certainly, said Danglars, in the most natural tone in the world. Are you then pressed for this money? Yes, for the examination of our cash takes place tomorrow. Tomorrow? Why did you not tell me so before? Why, it is as good as a century. At what hour does the examination take place? At two o'clock. Send it twelve, said Danglars, smiling. Monsieur de Beauville said nothing but nodded his head and took up the portfolio. Now I think of it, you can do better, said Danglars. How do you mean? The receipt of Monsieur de Monte Cristo is as good as money. Take it to Rothschild's or Lafitte's, and they will take it off your hands at once. What, though payable at Rome? Certainly. It will only cost you a discount of 5,000 or 6,000 francs. The receiver started back. Ma foi, he said. I prefer waiting till tomorrow. What a proposition. I thought perhaps, said Danglars with supreme impertinence, that you had a deficiency to make up. Indeed, said the receiver. And if that were the case, it would be worthwhile to make some sacrifice. Thank you. No, sir. Then it will be tomorrow. Yes, but without fail. Ah, uh, you are laughing at me. Send tomorrow at twelve, and the bank shall be notified. I will come myself. Better still, since it will afford me the pleasure of seeing you. They shook hands. By the way, said Monsieur de Beauville, are you not going to the funeral of poor Mademoiselle de Villefort, which I met on my road here? No, said the banker. I have appeared rather ridiculous since that affair of Benedetto, so I remain in the background. Bah! You are wrong. How are you to blame for that affair? Listen, when one bears an irreproachable name as I do, one is rather sensitive. Everybody pities you, sir, and, above all, Mademoiselle Danglars. Poor Eugenie, said Danglars. Do you know she is going to embrace a religious life? No. Alas, it is unhappily but too true. The day after the event, she decided on leaving Paris with a nun of her acquaintance. They are gone to seek a very strict convent in Italy or Spain. Oh, it is terrible! And Monsieur de Beauville retired with this exclamation, after expressing acute sympathy with the father. But he had scarcely left before Danglars, with an energy of action those can alone understand who have seen Robert Macaire represented by Frederick, exclaimed, Fool! Then enclosing Monte Cristo's receipt in a little pocket book, he added, Yes, come at twelve o'clock. I shall then be far away. Then he double-locked his door, emptied all his drawers, collected about fifty thousand francs in banknotes, burned several papers, left others exposed to view, and then commenced writing a letter which he addressed to Madame la Baronne Danglars. I will place it on her table myself tonight, he murmured. Then taking a passport from his drawer, he said, Good, it is available for two months longer. End of chapter 104 
Chapter 105 of The Count of Monte Cristo The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 105 The Cemetery of Père Lachaise Monsieur de Beauville had indeed met the funeral procession which was taking Valentine to her last home on earth. The weather was dull and stormy. A cold wind shook the few remaining yellow leaves from the boughs of the trees, and scattered them among the crowd which filled the boulevards. Monsieur de Villefort, a true Parisian, considered the cemetery of Père Lachaise alone worthy of receiving the mortal remains of a Parisian family. There alone the corpses belonging to him would be surrounded by worthy associates. He had therefore purchased a vault, which was quickly occupied by members of his family. On the front of the monument was inscribed, The Families of St. Moran in Villefort for such had been the last wish expressed by poor René, Valentine's mother. The pompous procession, therefore, wended its way towards Père Lachaise from Faubourg saint Honore. Having crossed Paris, it passed through the Faubourg du Temple, then leaving the exterior boulevards, it reached the cemetery. More than fifty private carriages followed the twenty mourning coaches, and behind them more than five hundred persons joined in the procession on foot. These last consisted of all the young people whom Valentine's death had struck like a thunderbolt, and who, notwithstanding the raw chilliness of the season, could not refrain from paying a last tribute to the memory of the beautiful, chaste, and adorable girl, thus cut off in the flower of her youth. As they left Paris, an equipage with four horses, at full speed, was seen to draw up suddenly. It contained Monte Cristo. The Count left the carriage and mingled in the crowd who followed on foot. Chateau Renault perceived him, and immediately alighting from his coupe, joined him. The Count looked attentively through every opening in the crowd. He was evidently watching for someone, but his search ended in disappointment. "'Where is Morel?' he asked. "'Do either of these gentlemen know where he is?' "'We have already asked that question,' said Chateau Renault, "'for none of us has seen him.' The Count was silent, but continued to gaze around him. At length they arrived at the cemetery. The piercing eye of Monte Cristo glanced through clusters of bushes and trees, and was soon relieved from all anxiety, for seeing a shadow glide between the yew trees, Monte Cristo recognized him whom he sought. One funeral is generally very much like another in this magnificent metropolis. Black figures are seen scattered over the long white avenues, the silence of earth and heaven is alone broken by the noise made by the crackling branches of the hedges planted around the monuments. Then follows the melancholy chant of the priests, mingled now and then with a sob of anguish, escaping from some woman concealed behind a mass of flowers. The shadow Monte Cristo had noticed passed rapidly behind the tomb of Abelard and Eloise, placed itself close to the heads of the horses belonging to the hearse, and followed the undertaker's men arrived with them at the spot appointed for the burial. Each person's attention was occupied. Monte Cristo saw nothing but the shadow, which no one else observed. Twice the Count left the ranks to see whether the object of his interest had any concealed weapon beneath his clothes. When the procession stopped, this shadow was recognized as Morel, who, with his coat buttoned up to his throat, his face livid, and convulsively crushing his hat between his fingers, leaned against a tree, situated on an elevation commanding the mausoleum, so that none of the funeral details could escape his observation. Everything was conducted in the usual manner. A few men, the least impressed of all by the scene, pronounced a discourse, some deploring this premature death, others expatiating on the grief of the father, and one very ingenious person quoting the fact that Valentine had solicited pardon of her father for criminals on whom the arm of justice was ready to fall until at length they exhausted their stores of metaphor and mournful speeches. Monte Cristo heard and saw nothing, or rather he only saw Morel, whose calmness had a frightful effect on those who knew what was passing in his heart. See, said Bouchamp, pointing out Morel to Debray, what is he doing up there? And they called Chateau Renaud's attention to him. How pale he is, said Chateau Renaud, shuddering. He is cold, said Debray. Not at all, said Chateau Renaud slowly. I think he is violently agitated. 
He is very susceptible. Bah, said Debray. He scarcely knew Mademoiselle de Villefort. You said so yourself. True. Still, I remember he danced three times with her at Madame de Morcerf's. Do you recollect that ball, Count, where you produced such an effect? No, I do not, replied Monte Cristo, without even knowing of what or to whom he was speaking. So much was he occupied in watching Morel, who was holding his breath with emotion. The discourse is over. Farewell, gentlemen, said the Count, and he disappeared without anyone seeing whither he went. The funeral being over, the guests returned to Paris. Chateau Renaud looked for a moment for Morel, but while they were watching the departure of the Count, Morel had quitted his post, and Chateau Renaud, failing in his search, joined Debray and Beauchamp. Monte Cristo concealed himself behind a large tomb and awaited the arrival of Morel, who by degrees approached the tomb now abandoned by spectators and workmen. Morel threw a glance around, but before it reached the spot occupied by Monte Cristo, the latter had advanced yet nearer, still unperceived. The young man knelt down. The Count, with outstretched neck and glaring eyes, stood in an attitude ready to pounce upon Morel upon the first occasion. Morel bent his head till it touched the stone. Then, clutching the grating with both hands, he murmured, Oh, Valentine! The Count's heart was pierced by the utterance of these two words. He stepped forward, and touching the young man's shoulder, said, I was looking for you, my friend. Monte Cristo expected a burst of passion, but he was deceived, for Morel, turning around, said calmly, You see, I was praying. The scrutinizing glance of the Count searched the young man from head to foot. He then seemed more easy. Shall I drive you back to Paris? he asked. No, thank you. Do you wish anything? Leave me to pray. The Count withdrew without opposition, but it was only to place himself in a situation where he could watch every movement of Morel, who at length arose, brushed the dust from his knees, and turned towards Paris, without once looking back. He walked slowly down the Rue de la Roquet. The Count, dismissing his carriage, followed him about a hundred paces behind. Maximilian crossed the canal and entered the Rue Maslay by the boulevards. Five minutes after the door had been closed on Morel's entrance, it was again opened for the Count. Julie was at the entrance of the garden, where she was attentively watching Penelon, who, entering with zeal into his profession of gardener, was very busy grafting some Bengal roses. "'Ah, Count!' she exclaimed, with the delight manifested by every member of the family whenever he visited the Rue Malay. "'Maximilian has just returned, has he not, madame?' asked the Count. "'Yes, I think I saw him pass, but pray, call Emmanuel.' "'Excuse me, madame, but I must go to Maximilian's room this instant,' replied Monte Cristo. "'I have something of the greatest importance to tell him.' "'Go, then.' she said with a charming smile, which accompanied him until he had disappeared. Monte Cristo soon ran up the staircase, conducting from the ground floor to Maximilian's room. When he reached the landing, he listened attentively, but all was still. Like many old houses occupied by a single family, the room door was paneled with glass, but it was locked. Maximilian was shut in, and it was impossible to see what was passing in the room, because a red curtain was drawn before the glass. The Count's anxiety was manifested by a bright color which seldom appeared on the face of that imperturbable man. What shall I do? he uttered, and reflected for a moment. Shall I ring? No, the sound of a bell announcing a visitor will but accelerate the resolution of one in Maximilian's situation, and then the bell would be followed by a louder noise. Monte Cristo trembled from head to foot, and as if his determination had been taken with the rapidity of lightning, he struck one of the panes of glass with his elbow. The glass was shivered to atoms. Then, withdrawing the curtain, he saw Morel, who had been writing at his desk, bound from his seat at the noise of the broken window. "'I beg a thousand pardons,' said the Count. "'There is nothing the matter, but I slipped down and broke one of your panes of glass with my elbow. Since it is opened,' I will take advantage of it to enter your room. Do not disturb yourself. Do not disturb yourself. And passing his hand through the broken glass, the Count opened the door. 
Morel, evidently discomposed, came to meet Monte Cristo less with the intention of receiving him than to exclude his entry. Ma foi, said Monte Cristo, rubbing his elbow, it's all your servant's fault. Your stairs are so polished it is like walking on glass. Are you hurt, sir? coldly asked Morel. I believe not, but what are you about there? You were writing. Your fingers are stained with ink. Ah, true, I was writing. I do sometimes, soldier though I am. Monte Cristo advanced into the room. Maximilian was obliged to let him pass, but he followed him. You are writing? said Monte Cristo with a searching look. I have already had the honor of telling you I was, said Morel. The Count looked around him. Your pistols are beside your desk, said Monte Cristo, pointing with his finger to the pistols on the table. I am at the point of starting on a journey, replied Morel disdainfully. My friend, exclaimed Monte Cristo in a tone of exquisite sweetness. Sir, my friend, my dear Maximilian, do not make a hasty resolution, I entreat you. I make a hasty resolution, said Morel, shrugging his shoulders. Is there anything extraordinary in a journey? Maximilian, said the Count, let us both lay aside the mask we have assumed. You no more deceive me with that false calmness than I impose upon you with my frivolous solicitude. You can understand, can you not, that to have acted as I have done, to have broken that glass, to have intruded on the solitude of a friend, you can understand that, to have done all this, I must have been actuated by real uneasiness, or rather by a terrible conviction. Morel, you are going to destroy yourself. Indeed, Count, said Morel, shuddering. What has put this into your head? I tell you that you are about to destroy yourself, continued the Count, and here is proof of what I say. And approaching the desk, he removed the sheet of paper which Morel had placed over the letter he had begun, and took the latter in his hands. Morel rushed forward to tear it from him, but Monte Cristo, perceiving his intention, seized his wrist with an iron grasp. You wish to destroy yourself, said the Count. You have written it. Well, said Morel, changing his expression of calmness for one of violence, well, and if I do intend to turn this pistol against myself, who shall prevent me? Who will dare prevent me? All my hopes are blighted. My heart is broken. My life a burden. Everything around me is sad and mournful. Earth has become distasteful to me, and human voices distract me. It is a mercy to let me die, for if I live I shall lose my reason and become mad. When, sir, I tell you all this with tears of heartfelt anguish, can you reply that I am wrong? Can you prevent my putting an end to my miserable existence? Tell me, sir, could you have the courage to do so? Yes, Morel, said Monte Cristo with a calmness which contrasted strangely with the young man's excitement. Yes, I would do so. You, exclaimed Morel with increasing anger and reproach, you, who have deceived me with false hopes, who have cheered and soothed me with vain promises, when I might, if not have saved her, at least have seen her die in my arms, you, who pretend to understand everything, even the hidden sources of knowledge, and who enact the part of a guardian angel upon earth, and could not even find an antidote to a poison administered to a young girl? Ah, sir, indeed, you would inspire me with pity, were you not hateful in my eyes. Morel, yes, you tell me to lay aside the mask, and I will do so. Be satisfied. When you spoke to me at the cemetery, I answered you. My heart was softened. When you arrived here, I allowed you to enter. But since you abused my confidence, since you have devised a new torture after I thought I had exhausted them all, then, Count of Monte Cristo, my pretended benefactor, then, Count of Monte Cristo, the universal guardian, be satisfied. You shall witness the death of your friend. And Morel, with a maniacal laugh, again rushed towards the pistols. And again I repeat, you shall not commit suicide. Prevent me then, replied Morel with another struggle, which, like the first, failed in releasing him from the Count's iron grasp. I will prevent you. And who are you then that arrogate to yourself this tyrannical right over free and rational beings? Who am I? repeated Monte Cristo. Listen. I am the only man in the world having the right to say to you, Morel, your father's son shall not die today. 
and Monte Cristo, with an expression of majesty and sublimity, advanced with arms folded towards the young man, who, involuntarily overcome by the commanding manner of this man, recoiled a step. "'Why do you mention my father?' stammered he. "'Why do you mingle a recollection of him with the affairs of today?' because I am he who saved your father's life when he wished to destroy himself, as you do today, because I am the man who sent the purse to your young sister and the fairy own to old Morel, because I am the Edmond Dantes who nursed you, a child, on my knees. Morel made another step back, staggering, breathless, crushed. Then all his strength gave way, and he fell prostrate at the feet of Monte Cristo, then his admirable nature underwent a complete and sudden revulsion. He arose, rushed out of the room and to the stairs, exclaiming energetically, Julie, Julie, Emmanuel, Emmanuel! Monte Cristo endeavored also to leave, but Maximilian would have died rather than relax his hold on the handle of the door, which he closed upon the count. Julie, Emmanuel, and some of the servants ran up in alarm on hearing the cries of Maximilian. Morel seized their hands, and opening the door, exclaimed in a voice choked with sobs, On your knees, on your knees, he is our benefactor, the savior of our father, he is... He would have added Edmond Dantes, but the Count seized his arm and prevented him. Julie threw herself into the arms of the Count. Emmanuel embraced him as a guardian angel. Morel again fell on his knees and struck the ground with his forehead, then the iron-hearted man felt his heart swell in his breast. A flame seemed to rush from his throat to his eyes. He bent his head and wept. For a while nothing was heard in the room but a succession of sobs, while the incense from their grateful hearts mounted to heaven. Julie had scarcely recovered from her deep emotion when she rushed out of the room, descended to the next floor, ran into the drawing-room with childlike joy, and raised the crystal globe which covered the purse given by the unknown of the Allo de Millon. Meanwhile, Emmanuel, in a broken voice, said to the Count, Oh, Count, how could you, hearing us so often speak of our unknown benefactor, seeing us pay such homage of gratitude and adoration to his memory, how could you continue so long without discovering yourself to us? Oh, it was cruel to us, and, dare I say it, to you also. Listen, my friends, said the Count. I may call you so, since we have really been friends for the last eleven years. The discovery of this secret has been occasioned by a great event which you must never know. I wish to bury it during my whole life in my own bosom, but your brother Maximilian wrested it from me by a violence he repents of now, I am sure. Then turning around, and seeing that Morel, still on his knees, had thrown himself into an armchair, he added in a low voice, pressing Emmanuel's hand significantly, Watch over him. Why so? asked the young man, surprised. I cannot explain myself, but watch over him. Emmanuel looked around the room and caught sight of the pistols. His eyes rested on the weapons, and he pointed to them. Monte Cristo bent his head. Emmanuel went towards the pistols. Leave them, said Monte Cristo. Then walking towards Morel, he took his hand. The tumultuous agitation of the young man was succeeded by a profound stupor. Julie returned, holding the silken purse in her hands, while tears of joy rolled down her cheeks like dewdrops on the rose. Here is the relic, she said. Do not think it will be less dear to us now we are acquainted with our benefactor. My child, said Monte Cristo, coloring, allow me to take back that purse. Since you now know my face, I wish to be remembered alone through the affection I hope you will grant me. Oh, said Julie, pressing the purse to her heart. No, no, I beseech you do not take it, for some unhappy day you will leave us, will you not? You have guessed rightly, madame, replied Monte Cristo, smiling. In a week I shall have left this country, where so many persons who merit the vengeance of heaven lived happily, while my father perished of hunger and grief. While announcing his departure, the Count fixed his eyes on Morel and remarked that the words, I shall have left this country, had failed to rouse him from his lethargy. He then saw that he must take another struggle against the grief of his friend, and taking the hands of Emmanuel and Julie, which he pressed within his own, he said with the mild authority of a father, 
My kind friends, leave me alone with Maximilian. Julie saw the means offered of carrying off her precious relic, which Monte Cristo had forgotten. She drew her husband to the door. Let us leave them, she said. The Count was alone with Morel, who remained motionless as a statue. Come, said Monte Cristo, touching his shoulder with his finger. Are you a man again, Maximilian? Yes, for I begin to suffer again. The Count frowned, apparently in gloomy hesitation. Maximilian, Maximilian, he said, the ideas you yield to are unworthy of a Christian. Oh, do not fear, my friend, said Morel, raising his head and smiling with a sweet expression on the Count. Then we are to have no more pistols, no more despair? No, I have found a better remedy for my grief than either a bullet or a knife. Poor fellow, what is it? My grief will kill me of itself. My friend, said Monte Cristo, with an expression of melancholy equal to his own, listen to me. One day, in a moment of despair like yours, since it led to a similar resolution, I also wished to kill myself. One day your father, equally desperate, wished to kill himself too. If anyone had said to your father, at the moment he raised the pistol to his head, if anyone had told me, when in my prison I pushed back the food I had not tasted for three days, if anyone had said to either of us then, Live, the day will come when you will be happy and will bless life. No matter whose voice had spoken, we should have heard him with the smile of doubt or the anguish of incredulity. And yet how many times has your father blessed life while embracing you? How often have I myself? Ah, exclaimed Morel, interrupting the Count. You had only lost your liberty. My father had only lost his fortune. But I have lost Valentine. Look at me, said Monte Cristo with that expression which sometimes made him so eloquent and persuasive. Look at me. There are no tears in my eyes, nor is there fever in my veins. Yet I see you suffer, you, Maximilian, whom I love as my own son. Well... Does not this tell you that in grief, as in life, there is always something to look forward to beyond? Now, if I entreat, if I order you to live, Morel, it is in the conviction that one day you will thank me for having preserved your life. Oh, heavens, said the young man. Oh, heavens, what are you saying, Count? Take care, but perhaps you have never loved. Child, replied the Count. I mean, as I love... You see, I have been a soldier ever since I attained manhood. I reached the age of twenty-nine without loving, for none of the feelings I before then experienced merit the appellation of love. Well, at twenty-nine I saw Valentine. For two years I have loved her. For two years I have seen written in her heart, as in a book, all the virtues of a daughter and wife. Count, to possess Valentine would have been a happiness too infinite. Too ecstatic, too complete, too divine for this world, since it has been denied me. But without Valentine, the earth is desolate. I have told you to hope, said the Count. Then have a care, I repeat, for you seek to persuade me, and if you succeed I should lose my reason, for I should hope that I could again behold Valentine. The Count smiled. My friend, my father said Morel with excitement. Have a care, I again repeat, for the power you wield over me alarms me. Weigh your words before you speak, for my eyes have already become brighter, and my heart beats strongly. Be cautious, or you will make me believe in supernatural agencies. I must obey you, though you bade me call forth the dead or walk upon the water. Hope, my friend, repeated the Count. Oh, said Morel, falling from the height of excitement to the abyss of despair. Ah, you are playing with me like those good or rather selfish mothers who soothe their children with honeyed words because their screams annoy them. No, my friend, I was wrong to caution you. Do not fear. I will bury my grief so deep in my heart. I will disguise it so that you shall not even care to sympathize with me. Adieu, my friend. Adieu. On the contrary, said the Count, after this time you must live with me. You must not leave me. 
and in a week we shall have left France behind us. And you still bid me hope? I tell you to hope because I have a method of curing you. Count, you render me sadder than before if it be possible. You think the result of this blow has been to produce an ordinary grief, and you would cure it by an ordinary remedy, change of scene. And Morel dropped his head with disdainful incredulity. What can I say more? asked Monte Cristo. I have confidence in the remedy I propose, and only ask you to permit me to assure you of its efficacy. Count, you prolong my agony. Then, said the Count, your feeble spirit will not even grant me the trial I request. Come, do you know of what the Count of Monte Cristo is capable? Do you know that he holds terrestrial beings under his control? Nay, that he can almost work a miracle? Well, wait for the miracle I hope to accomplish. Or, or, repeated Morel, or take care, Morel, lest I call you ungrateful. Have pity on me, Count. I feel so much pity towards you, Maximilian, that, listen to me attentively, if I do not cure you in a month, to the day, to the very hour, mark my words, Morel, I will place loaded pistols before you, and a cup of the deadliest Italian poison, a poison more sure and prompt than that which has killed Valentine. Will you promise me? Yes, for I am a man, and have suffered like yourself, and also contemplated suicide. Indeed, often since misfortune has left me, I have longed for the delights of an eternal sleep. But you are sure you will promise me this, said Morel, intoxicated. I not only promise, but swear it, said Monte Cristo, extending his hand. In a month, then, on your honor, if I am not consoled, you will let me take my life into my own hands, and whatever may happen, you will not call me ungrateful? In a month to the day, the very hour and the date are sacred, Maximilian. I do not know whether you remember that this is the 5th of September. It is ten years today since I saved your father's life, who wished to die. Morel seized the Count's hand and kissed it. The Count allowed him to pay the homage he felt due him. In a month you will find on the table at which we shall be then sitting, good pistols and a delicious draught. But, on the other hand, you must promise me not to attempt your life before that time. Oh, I also swear it. Monte Cristo drew the young man towards him and pressed him for some time to his heart. And now, he said, after today you will come and live with me. You can occupy Hadi's apartment, and my daughter will at least be replaced by my son. Hadi? said Morel. What has become of her? She departed last night. To leave you? To wait for me. Hold yourself ready, then, to join me at Champs-Élysées, and lead me out of this house without anyone seeing my departure. Maximilian hung his head and obeyed with childlike reverence. End of chapter 105 Chapter 106 of The Count of Monte Cristo The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas Chapter 106. Dividing the Proceeds The apartment on the second floor of the house in the Rue Saint-Germain-des-Prés, where Albert de Morcerf had selected a home for his mother, was let to a very mysterious person. This was a man whose face the concierge himself had never seen, for in the winter his chin was buried in one of the large red handkerchiefs worn by gentlemen's coachmen on a cold night, and in the summer he made a point of always blowing his nose just as he approached the door. Contrary to custom, this gentleman had not been watched, for as the report ran that he was a person of high rank, and one who would allow no impertinent interference, his incognito was strictly respected. His visits were tolerably regular, though occasionally he appeared a little before or after his time, but generally, both in summer and winter, he took possession of his apartment about four o'clock, though he never spent the night there. At half-past three in the winter, the fire was lighted by the discreet servant, who had the superintendence of the little apartment, and in the summer, ices were placed on the table at the same hour. At four o'clock, as we have already stated, the mysterious personage arrived. Twenty minutes afterwards, a carriage stopped at the house, a lady alighted in a black or dark blue dress, and always thickly veiled. She passed like a shadow through the lodge, and ran upstairs without a sound escaping under the touch of her light foot. No one ever asked her where she was going. 
Her face, therefore, like that of the gentleman, was perfectly unknown to the two concierges, who were perhaps unequaled throughout the capital for discretion. We need not say she stopped at the second floor. Then she tapped in a peculiar manner at a door, which after being opened to admit her was again fastened, and curiosity penetrated no farther. They used the same precautions in leaving as in entering the house. The lady always left first, and as soon as she had stepped into her carriage, it drove away, sometimes towards the right hand, sometimes to the left. Then, about twenty minutes afterwards, the gentleman would also leave, buried in his cravat or concealed by his handkerchief. The day after Monte Cristo had called upon Danglars, the mysterious lodger entered at ten o'clock in the morning instead of four in the afternoon. Almost directly afterwards, without the usual interval of time, a cab arrived, and the veiled lady ran hastily upstairs. The door opened, but before it could be closed, the lady exclaimed, "'Oh, Lucien, oh, my friend!' The concierge, therefore, heard for the first time that the lodger's name was Lucien. Still, as he was the very perfection of a doorkeeper, he made up his mind not to tell his wife. "'Well, what is the matter, my dear?' asked the gentleman whose name the lady's agitation revealed. "'Tell me, what is the matter?' "'Oh, Lucien, can I confide in you?' "'Of course, you know you can do so. But what can be the matter? Your note of this morning has completely bewildered me. This precipitation, this unusual appointment. Come, ease me of my anxiety, or else frighten me at once.' "'Lucien, a great event has happened,' said the lady, glancing inquiringly at Lucien. "'Monsieur Danglars left last night.' "'Left? Monsieur Danglars left? Where has he gone?' "'I do not know.' "'What do you mean? Has he gone intending not to return?' "'Undoubtedly. At ten o'clock at night his horses took him to the barrier of Charenton. There a post-chaise was waiting for him. He entered it with his valet de chambre, saying that he was going to Fontainebleau.' Then what did you mean? Stay. He left a letter for me. A letter? Yes, read it. And the baroness took from her pocket a letter, which she gave to Debray. Debray paused a moment before reading, as if trying to guess its contents, or perhaps while making up his mind how to act, whatever it might contain. No doubt his ideas were arranged in a few minutes, for he began reading the letter which caused so much uneasiness in the heart of the baroness, and which ran as follows. Madame and most faithful wife, Debray mechanically stopped and looked at the baroness, whose face became covered with blushes. Read, she said. Debray continued. When you receive this, you will no longer have a husband. Oh, you need not be alarmed. You will only have lost him as you have lost your daughter. I mean that I shall be traveling on one of the thirty or forty roads leading out of France. I owe you some explanations for my conduct, and as you are a woman that can perfectly understand me, I will give them. Listen, then. I received this morning five millions, which I paid away. Almost directly afterwards, another demand for the same sum was presented to me. I put this creditor off till tomorrow, and I intend leaving today to escape that tomorrow, which would be rather too unpleasant for me to endure. You understand this, do you not, my most precious wife? I say you understand this, because you are as conversant with my affairs as I am. Indeed, I think you understand them better, since I am ignorant of what has become of a considerable portion of my fortune, once very tolerable, while I am sure, madame, that you know perfectly well. For women have infallible instincts. They can never explain the marvellous by an algebraic calculation they have invented. But I, who only understand my own figures, know nothing more than that one day these figures deceived me. Have you admired the rapidity of my fall? Have you been slightly dazzled at the sudden fusion of my ignorance? I confess I have seen nothing but the fire. Let us hope you have found some gold among the ashes. With this consoling idea, I leave you, madame, and most prudent wife, without any conscientious reproach for abandoning you. You have friends left, and the ashes I have already mentioned, and above all the liberty I hasten to restore to you. And here, madame, I must add another word of explanation. So long as I hoped you were working for the good of our house and for the fortune of our daughter, I philosophically closed my eyes. But, as you have transformed that house into a vast ruin, I will not be the foundation of another man's fortune. You were rich when I married you, but little respected. Excuse me for speaking so very candidly, but, as this is intended only for ourselves, I do not see why I should weigh my words. I have augmented our fortune, and it has continued to increase during the last fifteen years, till extraordinary and unexpected catastrophes have suddenly overturned it, without any fault of mine, I can honestly declare." 
You, madame, have only sought to increase your own, and I am convinced that you have succeeded. I leave you, therefore, as I took you, rich, but little respected. Adieu. I also intend from this time to work on my own account. Accept my acknowledgments for the example you have set me, and which I intend following. Your very devoted husband, Baron Danglars. The baroness had watched Debray while he read this long and painful letter, and saw him, notwithstanding his self-control, change color once or twice. When he had ended the perusal, he folded the letter and resumed his pensive attitude. Well, asked Madame de Glars, with an anxiety easy to be understood. Well, madame, unhesitatingly repeated Debray, with what ideas does that letter inspire you? Oh, it is simple enough, madame. It inspires me with the idea that Monsieur Danglars has left suspiciously. Certainly, but is this all you have to say to me? I do not understand you, said Debray with freezing coldness. He is gone, gone, never to return. Oh, madame, do not think that. I tell you, he will never return. I know his character. He is inflexible in any resolutions formed for his own interests. If he could have made any use of me, he would have taken me with him. He leaves me in Paris, as our separation will conduce to his benefit. Therefore, he has gone, and I am free. Forever, added Madame Danglars, in the same supplicating tone. Debray, instead of answering, allowed her to remain in an attitude of nervous inquiry. Well, she said at length, do you not answer me? I have but one question to ask you. What do you intend to do? I was going to ask you, replied the baroness with a beating heart. Ah, then, you wish to ask advice of me? Yes, I do wish to ask your advice, said Madame Danglars with anxious expectation. Then, if you wish to take my advice, said the young man coldly, I would recommend you to travel. To travel, she murmured. Certainly. As Monsieur Danglars says, you are rich and perfectly free. In my opinion, a withdrawal from Paris is absolutely necessary after the double catastrophe of Mademoiselle Danglars' broken contract and Monsieur Danglars' disappearance. The world will think you abandoned and poor, for the wife of a bankrupt would never be forgiven were she to keep up an appearance of opulence. You have only to remain in Paris for about a fortnight, telling the world you are abandoned, and relating the details of this desertion to your best friends, who will soon spread the report. Then you can quit your house, leaving your jewels and giving up your jointure, and everyone's mouth will be filled with praises of your disinterestedness. They will know you are deserted, and think you also poor, for I alone know your real financial position, and am quite ready to give up my accounts as an honest partner." The dread with which the pale and motionless baroness listened to this was equaled by the calm indifference with which Debray had spoken. Deserted? she repeated. Ah, oh, yes, I am indeed deserted. You are right, sir, and no one can doubt my position. These were the only words that this proud and violently enamored woman could utter in response to Debray. But then you are rich, very rich indeed, continued Debray, taking out some papers from his pocket book, which he spread upon the table. Madame de Glars did not see them. She was engaged in stilling the beatings of her heart and restraining the tears which were ready to gush forth. At length a sense of dignity prevailed, and if she did not entirely master her agitation, she at least succeeded in preventing the fall of a single tear. Madame, said de Bray, it is nearly six months since we have been associated. You furnished a principal of a hundred thousand francs. Our partnership began in the month of April. In May we commenced operations, and in the course of the month gained 450,000 francs. In June the profit amounted to 900,000. In July we added 1,700,000 francs. It was, you know, the month of the Spanish bonds. In August we lost 300,000 francs at the beginning of the month, but on the 13th we made up for it. And we now find that our accounts, reckoning from the first day of partnership up to yesterday, when I closed them, showed a capital of 2,400,000 francs, that is, 1,200,000 for each of us. Now, madame, said Debray, delivering up his accounts in the methodical manner of a stockbroker, there are still 80,000 francs, the interest of this money, in my hands. But, the baroness said, I thought you never put the money out to interest. "'Excuse me, madame,' said Debray coldly. "'I had your permission to do so, and I have made use of it. "'There are, then, forty thousand francs for your share, "'besides the hundred thousand you furnished me to begin with, "'making, in all, one million three hundred and forty thousand francs for your portion. "'Now, madame, I took the precaution of drawing out your money the day before yesterday. "'It is not long ago, you see, and I was in continual expectation "'of being called on to deliver up my accounts. 
There is your money, half in banknotes, the other half in checks payable to bearer. I say there, for as I did not consider my house safe enough, or lawyers sufficiently discreet, and as landed property carries evidence with it, and moreover, since you have no right to possess anything independent of your husband, I have kept this sum, now your whole fortune, in a chest concealed under that closet, and, for greater security, I myself concealed it there. Now, madame, continued Debray, first opening the closet, then the chest. Now, madame, here are eight hundred notes of one thousand francs each, resembling, as you see, a large book bound in iron. To this I add a certificate in the funds of twenty-five thousand francs. Then, for the odd cash, making, I think, about a hundred and ten thousand francs, here is a check upon my banker, who, not being Monsieur Danglars, will pay you the amount, you may rest assured. Madame Danglars mechanically took the check, the bond, and the heap of banknotes. This enormous fortune made no great appearance on the table. Madame Danglars, with tearless eyes, but with her breast heaving with concealed emotion, placed the banknotes in her bag, put the certificate and check into her pocket-book, and then, standing pale and mute, awaited one kind word of consolation. But she waited in vain. "'Now, madame,' said Debray, "'you have a splendid fortune, an income of about sixty thousand livres a year, which is enormous for a woman who cannot keep an establishment here for a year at least. You will be able to indulge all your fancies. Besides, should you find your income insufficient, you can, for the sake of the past, madame, make use of mine, and I am ready to offer you all I possess, on loan.' "'Thank you, sir. Thank you,' replied the baroness. "'You forget that what you have just paid me is much more than a poor woman requires, "'who intends, for some time at least, to retire from the world.' "'Debray was, for a moment, surprised, but immediately recovering himself, "'he bowed with an air which seemed to say, "'As you please, madame.' "'Madame Danglars had until then, perhaps, hoped for something, "'but when she saw the careless bow of Debray and the glance by which it was accompanied, "'together with his significant silence, she raised her head, and without passion or violence, or even hesitation, ran downstairs, disdaining to address a last farewell to one who could thus part from her. Bah, said Debray, when she had left, these are fine projects. She will remain at home, read novels, and speculate at cards, since she can no longer do so on the bourse. Then, taking up his account, he cancelled with the greatest care all the entries of the amounts he had just paid away. I have one million sixty thousand francs remaining, he said. What a pity Mademoiselle de Villefort is dead. She suited me in every respect, and I would have married her. And he calmly waited until the twenty minutes had elapsed after Madame Danglars' departure before he left the house. During this time he occupied himself in making figures with his watch by his side. As Medeus, that diabolical personage, who would have been created by every fertile imagination if Lesage had not acquired the priority in his great masterpiece, would have enjoyed a singular spectacle if he had lifted up the roof of the little house in the Rue Saint-Germain-des-Prés, while Debray was casting up his figures. Above the room in which Debray had been dividing two millions and a half with Madame Danglars was another, inhabited by persons who have played too prominent a part in the incidents we have related for their appearance not to create some interest. Mercedes and Albert were in that room. Mercedes was much changed within the last few days. Not that even in her days of fortune she had ever dressed with the magnificent display which makes us no longer able to recognize a woman when she appears in a plain and simple attire. Nor, indeed, had she fallen into that state of depression where it is impossible to conceal the garb of misery. No, the change in Mercedes was that her eye no longer sparkled, her lips no longer smiled, and there was now a hesitation in uttering the words which formerly sprang so fluently from her ready wit. It was not poverty which had broken her spirit. It was not a want of courage which rendered her poverty burdensome. Mercedes, although deposed from the exalted position she had occupied, lost in the sphere she had now chosen, like a person passing from a room splendidly lighted into utter darkness, appeared like a queen, fallen from her palace to a hovel, and who, reduced to strict necessity, could neither become reconciled to the earthen vessels she was herself forced to place upon the table, nor to have the humble pallet which had become her bed. The beautiful Catalan and noble countess had lost both her proud glance and charming smile, because she saw nothing but misery around her. The walls were hung with one of the grey papers which economical landlords choose as not likely to show the dirt. The floor was uncarpeted. The furniture attracted the attention to the poor attempt at luxury. Indeed, everything offended eyes accustomed to refinement and elegance. Madame de Morcerf had lived there since leaving her house. The continual silence of the spot oppressed her. 
Still, seeing that Albert continually watched her countenance to judge the state of her feelings, she constrained herself to assume a monotonous smile of the lips alone, which, contrasted with the sweet and beaming expression that usually shone from her eyes, seemed like moonlight on a statue, yielding light without warmth. Albert, too, was ill at ease. The remains of luxury prevented him from sinking into his actual position. If he wished to go out without gloves, his hands appeared too white. If he wished to walk through the town, his boots seemed too highly polished. Yet these two noble and intelligent creatures, united by the indissoluble ties of paternal and filial love, had succeeded in tacitly understanding one another and economizing their stores. And Albert had been able to tell his mother without extorting a change of countenance, Mother, we have no more money. Mercedes had never known misery. She had often in her youth spoken of poverty, but between want and necessity, those synonymous words, there is a wide difference. Among the Catalans, Mercedes wished for a thousand things, but still she never really wanted any. So long as the nets were good, they caught fish, and so long as they sold their fish, they were able to buy twine for new nets. And then, shut out from friendship, having but one affection, which could not be mixed up with her ordinary pursuits, she thought of herself, of no one but herself. Upon the little she earned, she lived as well as she could. Now there were two to be supported, and nothing to live upon. Winter approached. Mercedes had no fire in that cold and naked room. She, who was accustomed to stoves which heated the house from the hall to the boudoir, she had not even one little flower, she whose apartment had been a conservatory of costly exotics. But she had her son. Hitherto the excitement of fulfilling a duty had sustained them, Excitement, like enthusiasm, sometimes renders us unconscious to the things of earth. But the excitement had calmed down, and they felt themselves obliged to descend from dreams to reality. After having exhausted the ideal, they found they must talk of the actual. Mother, exclaimed Albert, just as Madame Danglars was descending the stairs, let us reckon our riches, if you please. I want capital to build my plans upon. Capital? Nothing, replied Mercedes with a mournful smile. No, mother, capital three thousand francs, and I have an idea of our leading a delightful life upon this three thousand francs. Child, sighed Mercedes. Alas, dear mother, said the young man, I have unhappily spent too much of your money not to know the value of it. These three thousand francs are enormous, and I intend building upon this foundation a miraculous certainty for the future. You say this, my dear boy, but do you think we ought to accept these three thousand francs? said Mercedes, coloring. I think so, answered Albert in a firm tone. We will accept them the more readily, since we have them not here. You know they are buried in the garden of the little house in the Allée de Melun at Marseilles. With two hundred francs, we can reach Marseilles. With two hundred francs? Are you sure, Albert? Oh, as for that, I have made inquiries respecting the diligences and steamboats, and my calculations are made. You will take your place in the coupé to Chalon. You see, mother, I treat you handsomely for thirty-five francs. Albert then took a pen and wrote, Francs, coupé, thirty-five francs. From Chalon to Lyon, you will go on by the steamboat, six francs. From Lyon to Avignon, still by steamboat, sixteen francs. From Avignon to Marseille, seven francs. Expenses on the road, about fifty francs. Total, a hundred and fourteen francs. Let us put down a hundred and twenty, added Albert, smiling. You see, I am generous, am I not, mother? But you, my poor child... I? Do you not see that I reserve eighty francs for myself? A young man does not require luxuries. Besides, I know what travelling is. With a post-chaise and valet de chambre? Anyway, mother. Well, be it so. But these two hundred francs? Here they are, and two hundred more besides. See, I have sold my watch for a hundred francs, and the garden seals for three hundred. How fortunate that the ornaments were worth more than the watch. Still the same story of superfluities. Now I think we are rich, since instead of the 114 francs we require for the journey, we find ourselves in possession of 250. But we owe something in this house. 30 francs. But I pay that out of my 150 francs. That is understood. And as I require only 80 francs for my journey, you see I am overwhelmed with luxury. But that is not all. What do you say to this, mother? And Albert took out a little pocket book with golden clasps, a remnant of his old fancies, or perhaps a tender souvenir from one of the mysterious and veiled ladies who used to knock at his little door. Albert took out of his pocket book a note of a thousand francs. What is this? asked Mercedes. A thousand francs. But whence have you obtained them? 
Listen to me, mother, and do not yield too much to agitation. And Albert, rising, kissed his mother on both cheeks, then stood looking at her. You cannot imagine, mother, how beautiful I think you, said the young man, impressed with a profound feeling of filial love. You are, indeed, the most beautiful and most noble woman I ever saw. Dear child, said Mercedes, endeavoring in vain to restrain a tear which glistened in the corner of her eye. Indeed, you only wanted misfortune to change my love for you to admiration. I am not unhappy while I possess my son. Ah, just so, said Albert. Here begins the trial. Do you know the decision we have come to, mother? Have we come to any? Yes, it is decided that you are to live at Marseilles, and that I am to leave for Africa, where I will earn for myself the right to use the name I now bear, instead of the one I have thrown aside. Mercedes sighed. Well, mother, I yesterday engaged myself as substitute in the spies, added the young man, lowering his eyes with a certain feeling of shame, for even he was unconscious of the sublimity of his self-abasement. Note. The spahis are French cavalry reserved for service in Africa. End note. I thought my body was my own, and that I might sell it. I yesterday took the place of another. I sold myself for more than I thought I was worth, he added, attempting to smile. I fetched two thousand francs. Then... These one thousand francs, said Mercedes, shuddering, are the half of the sum, mother. The other will be paid in a year. Mercedes raised her eyes to heaven with an expression it would be impossible to describe, and tears, which had hitherto been restrained, now yielded to her emotion and ran down her cheeks. The price of his blood, she murmured. Yes, if I am killed, said Albert, laughing. But I assure you, mother, I have a strong intention of defending my person, and I never felt half so strong an inclination to live as I do now. Merciful heavens! Besides, mother, why should you make up your mind that I am to be killed? Has La Mauricière, that nay of the South, been killed? Has Changarnier been killed? Has Bedeau been killed? Has Morel, whom we know, been killed? Think of your joy, mother, when you see me return with an embroidered uniform— I declare I expect to look magnificent in it, and shows that regiment only from vanity. Mercedes sighed while endeavouring to smile. The devoted mother felt that she ought not to allow the whole weight of the sacrifice to fall upon her son. Well, now you understand, mother, continued Albert. Here are more than four thousand francs settled on you. Upon these you can live at least two years. Do you think so? said Mercedes. These words were uttered in so mournful a tone that their real meaning did not escape Albert. He felt his heart beat, and taking his mother's hand with his own, he said tenderly, Yes, you will live. I shall live. Then you will not leave me, Albert? Mother, I must go, said Albert, in a firm, calm voice. You love me too well to wish me to remain useless and idle with you. Besides, I have signed. You will obey your own wish and the will of heaven. Not my own wish, mother, but reason, necessity. Are we not two despairing creatures? What is life to you? Nothing. What is life to me? Very little without you, mother. For believe me, but for you, I should have ceased to live on the day I doubted my father and renounced his name. Well, I will live, if you promise me still to hope. And if you grant me the care of your future prospects, you will redouble my strength. Then I will go to the governor of Algeria. He has a royal heart, and is essentially a soldier— I will tell him my gloomy story. I will beg him to turn his eyes now and then towards me, and if he keep his word and interest himself for me, in six months I shall be an officer, or dead. If I am an officer, your fortune is certain, for I shall have money enough for both, and moreover a name we shall both be proud of, since it will be our own. If I am killed, well then, mother, you can also die, and there will be an end of our misfortunes. It is well, replied Mercedes, with her eloquent glance. You are right, my love. Let us prove to those who are watching our actions that we are worthy of compassion. But let us not yield to gloomy apprehensions, said the young man. I assure you we are, or rather we shall be, very happy. You are a woman at once full of spirit and resignation. I have become simple in my tastes, and am without passion, I hope. Once in service, I shall be rich. Once in Monsieur Dante's house, you will be at rest." Let us strive, I beseech you, let us strive to be cheerful. Yes, let us strive, for you ought to live, and to be happy, Albert. And so our division is made, mother, said the young man, affecting ease of mind. We can now part. Come, I shall engage your passage. And you, my dear boy? I shall stay here for a few days longer. We must accustom ourselves to parting. 
I want recommendations and some information relative to Africa. I will join you again at Marseille. Well, be it so. Let us part, said Mercedes, folding around her shoulders the only shawl she had taken away, and which accidentally happened to be a valuable black cashmere. Albert gathered up his papers hastily, rang the bell to pay the thirty francs he owed to the landlord, and offering his arm to his mother, they descended the stairs. Someone was walking down before them, and this person, hearing the rustling of a silk dress, turned around. De Bray, muttered Albert. You, Morcerf, replied the secretary, resting on the stairs. Curiosity had vanquished the desire of preserving his incognito, and he was recognized. It was, indeed, strange in this unknown spot to find the young man whose misfortunes had made so much noise in Paris. More surf, repeated Debray. Then, noticing in the dim light the still youthful and veiled figure of Madame de Morcerf, Pardon me, he added, with a smile. I leave you, Albert. Albert understood his thoughts. Mother, he said, turning towards Mercedes, this is Monsieur Debray, secretary of the Minister for the Interior, once a friend of mine. How once, stammered Debray, what do you mean? I say so, Monsieur Debray, because I have no friends now, and I ought not to have any. I thank you for having recognized me, sir. Debray stepped forward and cordially pressed the hand of his interlocutor. Believe me, dear Albert, he said, with all the emotion he was capable of feeling. Believe me, I feel deeply for your misfortunes, and if in any way I can serve you, I am yours. Thank you, sir, said Albert, smiling. In the midst of our misfortunes, we are still rich enough not to require assistance from anyone. We are leaving Paris, and when our journey is paid, we shall have five thousand francs left. The blood mounted to the temples of Debray, who had a million in his pocketbook, and unimaginative as he was, he could not help reflecting that the same house had contained two women, one of whom, justly dishonored, had left it poor with one million five hundred thousand francs under her cloak while the other, unjustly stricken, but sublime in her misfortune, was yet rich with a few diners. This parallel disturbed his usual politeness. The philosophy he witnessed appalled him. He muttered a few words of general civility and ran downstairs. That day the minister's clerks and the subordinates had a great deal to put up with from his ill humor. But that same night he found himself the possessor of a fine house situated on the boulevard de la Madeleine and an income of fifty thousand livres. The next day, just as Debray was signing the deed, that is, about five o'clock in the afternoon, Madame de Morcerf, after having affectionately embraced her son, entered the coupé of the diligence, which closed upon her. A man was hidden in Lafitte's banking house, behind one of the little arched windows which are placed above each desk. He saw Mercedes enter the diligence, and he also saw Albert withdraw. Then he passed his hand across his forehead, which was clouded with doubt. Alas! he exclaimed. How can I restore the happiness I have taken away from these poor, innocent creatures? God help me. End of chapter 106